All right, Nick. He's going to kick it off. Okay. All right. So anybody who cares, uh, I'm not sure if you guys, I think a couple of you were familiar that uh, I had brought a 3D printer out to another meeting and it had melted in the car, which uh, if you uh, build your printer out of, three, out of PLA, that's a tip. Don't leave it in your hot car all day. So, um, Can't you reprint it? So we did. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's the beauty of it. So anyway, sort of a uh, title I'm just going to go over just from the, just to not, uh, I'm just going to throw it at you straight because, you know, I've been through this. You know, whether you, whether you should do this or not, you know. Um, point of a rep wrap, and what it means is a, repli a re replicating rapid prototype typer. So if you design something and, um, you know, you, you, or you download the thing off the Thingiverse, uh, you can adjust things about it and then print it, and if it doesn't fit, print it again. So that's kind of the point. Um, replicating in the sense that the idea of a traditional rep wrap is that it can build itself, and that's what kind of led to the proliferation of open source 3D printers is that the design was sort of designed, Adrian Bower kind of put it out there, and then people were able to iteratively improve upon it, much like your Linux. So, you know, traditional traditional uh, 3D printers, at least following the RepRap mantra, are open source uh, devices, at least if you go to like RepRap.org, which that's where I kind of recommend you get started. Um, so yeah, RepRaps can make more RepRaps. You know, other 3D printers can generally make RepRaps, and generally speaking, regular 3D printers can't reproduce themselves. Um, at least I'm not familiar with a commercial 3D printer you know, commercial manufacturers aren't really interested in making a product that duplicates their own product. Really. Stupid, stupid question. Yeah. Uh, if a rep wrap makes another rep wrap, are the tolerances preserved or does the error increase? The idea is that all of the increase. structural components, like really the pieces, it's like Lincoln Logs, you know, the pieces that you're printing are the stuff you, you can't get off the shelf. And I'll, I'll touch on one aspect of that, like I'll, I'll go into it now. So there are different flavors of RepRap, actually. Uh, you can, you know, there's you know, tons of designs out there. Uh, the original ones that I would recommend that you stick to um, would be your Mendel flavor. And then if you really want to, understanding the, uh, the sort of shortcomings of the Prusa stuff. So the point of the Mendel is that really, with nothing other than like, you know, an Arduino uh, and some of the supporting steps and motors that can be salvaged from a, from a printer, stepper motors, um, you can build this from nothing. You know, with just the designs, you can produce a 3D printer. Um, you know, the, even the structural stuff you can make out of wood instead of being 3D printed. But the point is, once you, and that's called rep strapping, um, making something from nothing or whatever or what you have around. Um, but uh, I, ideally, you'll kind of go off of a kit or working off of, for, the, for the more complicated pieces of it. Um, because the, there, you'll see that there's kind of a price difference depending on which approach you take. Because you can go cheap by sourcing everything yourself, but you're, you're going to be putting in time into this thing. And to answer your question as far as tolerances, no, realistically. Like a home-built 3D printer can rival, if not exceed, what you can get out of the box out of any given 3D printer from any given manufacturer, truly. And, you, and, and, and basically, like, you know, when you it used to be with audio you're, tapes, you're, tenth generation no, 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 is... No, no. Because, you're, uh, George, you're building it from the design set each time, right? Yeah. Like and you're starting from the original copy. Okay. You're not remeasuring the one. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, the, you know, in, in your first design, you know, you're... you're certain parts of your design are going to be 3D printed, and in the third design, those same parts are going to be 3D printed. The rest of it is not going to be 3D printed. Um, there, you know, I was just kind of ballparking the list of the parts just for myself. I have a more detailed bomb somewhere, but uh, I don't have it here. But, you know, just ballparking the numbers on this stuff, you know, you can, you can throw together a printer pretty cheap. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what it's going to look like. Um, now, this is, this is a Mendel of our own design. This is actually our second generation printer. Like, we had a first one, and it printed this one. Uh, this one has some extra bells and whistles on it that we threw on there and you know we were taking pieces and parts from other people's designs like most Mendels don't have the motors on the bottom and uh, we have a spool holder up there on top and we mounted the LCD on there and the, L and the electronics are all tucked in nicely under there and you know a lot of the DIY stuff just kind of looks a lot more DIY but you know I worked hard on making this kind of like taking the sort of best pieces of a bunch of people's design. And the wire chain is a nice little plus. I mean, you can buy those. Honestly, if Temp took to print those, it was neat to be able to do it. And yeah, if you're bored and just trying to test the tolerances of your printer, you can you can jam those out. But like, honestly, you can get them like two feet on eBay for like five bucks. So it's like, it's nice, you know. It's so, But you know, that's the advantage of 3D printer. You can do it now, wait 20 minutes, have six inches, wait an hour, have, you know, a, like a good 18 inches. Or you can wait two weeks and get your two feet, you know. so. Compounded, you end up 
you know, ahead. If you were racing and one guy was ordering them online and you just sat there printing them for the two weeks it took him to get them, you could have a mile of these damn chains. So anyway, uh, those are some of the first prints off of this machine, but you know, like this guy, around 200 bucks, around 200 bucks. Um, multiple vendors for your electronics, <laughs> your, uh, your fasteners, you know, just because you want to get the good price. If you get, if you, you can buy everything online, but then you're going to get dumped for shipping and everything, you know, from one guy who sells the whole kit, like Boulder Tech, and they're cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you source your parts right, you can get under that point. Four plus vendors, and then uh, a bunch of your time. A bunch of your time to put it together, figure out how to put it together, put it together again. Uh, and then maybe you'll get to the point where you can, you know, build your own like this. But that's, that's kind of the point. If you do your first rep wrap this way, your second one's much easier. Yeah. So, or if you're, you know, you got somebody like me who can kind of help you along the way. Can, uh, you, aside from the monetary, there's 20 hours you guys. Well, um, that's just a guesstimate. I mean, okay. honestly, when we got our first uh, off the sh like basically, I got a Mendel, a Mendel three second hand, okay, and it was functional, but it was, you know, there were I knew it needed to be rebuilt, so we rebuilt it, the ground up. We rebuilt the whole damn thing, um, and getting that first printer working because I blanked out the firmware and I wanted to do a default settings without anything known. Yeah, it took 16 hours with a built machine. Okay, and that's, you know, coming from zero, coming from no 3D printer knowledge, digging into all this stuff, learning what a slicer, like how you go from a 3D model in something like OpenSCAD or simply, you know, whatever program for making 3D Maya, whatever, 3D model X, you know, to an actual thing, you know, and there's multiple steps in that thing and there is a learning curve to it. In addition to just like adjusting your printer settings for getting your best output and knowing the sort of black magic to that. And then there's different slicers out there. Simplify 3D is like $140 and it's not open source. You've got Cura, which is open source, but it's, you know, has some, some, some things about it. And then you've got totally like bare bones, Python based like a slicer with a three and then um, Scheme Forge. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you've got multiple pieces of software that may or may not be a part of your chain which go into taking the thing that you designed and turning it into a thing that you can hold into your hand. Um, but yeah, the printer is just one piece in the chain. And actually, just to kind of just explain, like, this is why these things are open source. These things are dumb as hell. Like, they don't really do anything. If you've ever worked in CNC or even if you haven't, you know, um, you've got what's called G-code, which is literally just telling the printer, like, you know, at least in a CNC machine, how fast to spin the drill where to go in coordinates, and you know that's it, pretty much. Like there's different types of instructions. You have to go here, change out tools here, but this uses the same, literally the same kind of instructions along with several custom codes. <laughs> and like a file for printing, um, in fact, I'll just bring one up for you. Uh, I'll do that later. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, uh, the, the files are plain text. You can read them. They're just coordinates and stuff. And that's why you can get Python scripts to like take, take an actual file that's going to the printer and flip it if you needed to for some reason, but it's better to just re-slice it in that case. Anyway, blah, 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 bunch of time. Tolerances are fine. And then your question was? Just regarding the, the time. I yeah, think, it's you time. Answer. No, I mean, especially if you're going from nothing. If you get somebody to help yeah. you, you're still going to invest a lot of time into learning your machine. And I recommend you do it. Because even if you go into a commercial machine, guess what? They're still using either Simplified 3D or Cura. And guess what? Inside, behind, under the hood, they're still using G-code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Unless you're in MakerBot, MakerBot has a binary format. But really, again, it's still just stepper motors and an extruder and all that. So anyway. you're talking 20 hours from nothing to the, to this level, or uh, to the first printer that's... It took us a good solid weekend to do this with a built printer. OK, so that's just bull parking, all right? Cool. Like, honestly, it's going to take some time. Right. Um, especially, again, if you haven't built one yet or you're not working with somebody who has, learning and digging through this documentation, which is totally non-trivial, um, you know, because, again, it's like, this is what happens, really, like, the rep, rep stuff, like the wiki, like, I've contributed there, I've got some articles there, um, but it's not as well-maintained as you would like, and it's a, it's a rat's nest of it. Like, you'll go in one place, it'll be documentation for one guy's printer, you'll go in another one, it's documentation for another guy's printer, you see how many freaking designs there are on the, like, this is just a touch, you know, this is just literally a taste of the printers that are on there. Um, and then, you know, like there's different types, like, you know, these are all um, Cartesian coordinate X, Y, Z, but then there's also uh, delta printers, which use like a, like a, like a, like they have three axes and like, or three arms that hold the head. It's, it, anyway, um, then there's different mechanisms for using whether the bed level up goes up or down or whether the tool head goes up or down. And that, that's just in the different formats. Again, Mendel Cartesian is really the way to start. It's the easiest to wrap your head around, um, but anyway. 
Does that cover it? Like, yeah, there, there's going to be time. Trust me. No, but I mean, so you're talking on the order of 20 hours. I mean, you're saying that's a lot. To me, that's not very much. That's a weekend. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you look, stuff. I mean, and that's going from like, you have a machine that has no firmware on it, and you need to download Marlin, and then learn how Marlin works, and what things about the printer, and then like, what the hell's an end stop, and what's, which one's my X end stop, and where's that plugged into my RAMP sport? What's a RAMP sport? You know, all this stuff, you know, again, if you're going off of somebody's bomb, you can generally follow their documentation. Like the Mendel 3 documentation is really good. And that's why I based my design off of it, because it's really just that good. Um, and it's a known design. You want to stay as close as you can to these known designs, because, you know, just for your own sanity, having somewhere to go of, like, to, you know, go from known to, like, what am I doing, you really want to. And that's why I kept my original printer printing throughout the entire process of getting my second printer online, so I could iterate parts and stuff. I wasn't just going to tear that thing down. And then once I had the second one ready to go, then we rebuilt our first one. You know, so, and then, you know, again, we could do that back and forth and get improvements across the line. So In fact, I still haven't upgraded my first printer to look like this. So that 20 hours is 20 hours for just the hardware without the software tool change? Actually, that was that, Chris. That you would. What would you say? That was two days. That was two full days when we initially got the printer to get it actually outputting, and that was it built. That was just the software. But that was going from zero knowledge of the software to program, like literally configuring the firmware, uploading it onto, onto the Arduino. Which, at that time, and it's still pretty much like this. But with that version of Marlin, you're having to open in, open the Marlin firmware in your Arduino IDE, customize the firmware, the H, the header files to your configuration, literally beds, because this thing, this same kind of firmware works on Delta machines, it works on Mendel's, it works on Cossels, it works on Prusas, it works on uh, everything. You can, and in fact, like a lot of commercial 3D printers may run Marlin or they may run some fork of it, you jam Marlin on there and you tell it about your printer and you're printing that because it supports cool things like acceleration and all this stuff, it's, and that's open source. But anyway, um, but yeah, there is there is there is a time investment. And even if it's like, it's gonna be reduced based on how much you already know about 3D printing. If you've done some, then yeah, it's not gonna be that hard. If you already need to understand how to set coordinates, how to get your thing printing in the center, how to calibrate, stuff like that, like, I mean, learning how to calibrate, that could take four, four freaking hours. Just go like, oh God, what are they talking about? You know, and that's why, Having auto calibration, which is on this printer, is kind of nice and all that. But anyway, you'll you'll get there if you if you go down this road, or you can go down this road. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. I don't think anybody should be afraid of this because it lets you start printing without all that headache of like, God, what did I get myself into? Um, you know, this is 350. It goes on sale. This is Monoprice. Which one is that? Uh, Monoprice. Monoprice. Monoprice Select. Um, this is this is a uh, this is Prusa. This is a Prusa. This is like a Prusa. Um, you know, it's got a nice case. Looks nice. Pretty clean. It's got wire chains. Uh, I don't know what firmware it runs. I bet you it runs the same. I bet you it runs Marlin. That looks like the exact same LCD I use with the same uh, rotary encoder. In fact, um, yeah. See, see the dimensions there. That looks pretty much the same. I couldn't tell you for sure. I haven't I haven't played with it myself, but like I know what this is because I know what Monoprice does. They just went and they go, cool, we want this. They found a cheap way to make it out of bed steel with the right tolerances. Lifetime warranty, probably not on the hot end and stuff like that, but you know, it'll get you by, it'll get you printing. And the fact is, this thing will get you printing your first rep wrap. So you could have this overnight, 300 bucks, when it's on sale, um, be printing the next day, upgrade this thing with a better hot end to get you different materials and stuff, be well on the way of you know getting your parts together so you're printing while you're getting your second one together because that's the cool thing about having a rep res. You really the point of having if you're not if you don't care about making another one get this because you're just gonna you're you're just gonna be blasting away anyway. And if you eventually get the bug in your head that you want to print more, well guess what you can't. You know you can just go on Thingiverse, find whoever's bomb of printable 3D printer parts, start cranking them out, get the rest of the parts, and put your, put your thing together. So you know I, I encourage people to look into something like this. Another angle sort of down that road would be something like folder tech. I don't like theirs um, just because it's lower quality components. Um, you know, you're dealing with a vendor that, you know, I bought stuff from him, but I don't know what his support's like, because everything, I, well, I mean, actually, I got, a, I got a piece that was broken and he replaced it, you know, so what can I say? I don't know how he supports the kits. Uh, basically, what I bought from him was this minus the power supply, minus the rod, so basically not even the motors, really just the hot hotbed, um, the thermistors, what did, we do? what did we figure out was the end stops, the thermistors, the electronics, the ramps, which stands for RepRap, Arduino, Mega, Polulu Shield. Um, Polulu is the stepper driver, so basically it's what takes the Arduino microcontroller information, talks to the stepper driver, stepper driver actually talks to the stepper motor and tells it to go. 
And that literally, you have to know what kind of stepper motors you have. You have to know what their micro steps are. You have to enter that stuff into the firmware. Otherwise, your thing's just not going to print. You have to you have to do calculations like that. Like I'm not trying to scare you. Like be prepared. For, I'm just telling you be prepared because if you run into this and you're like, I didn't know I had to do that. It's like, well, I'm telling. You. So like if you're making like uh, an extruder, I'm not sure I have a picture of it. Well, eh, it's kind of hidden here. Where is our extruder? This is a Bowden design, so it's actually above this shot in this picture. But um, the extruder is uh, you can and there's that that gets into another thing. Like you can uh, there's two different types of extruders, commonly. Bowden extruders have a tube here, and this is considered your cold end. So there's literally like a cranky spool thing right here that cranks cold filament. Kind of like it looks just like uh, weed whacker stuff if you haven't seen it into this hot end, which is literally just like a glue gun. And then it jams it out very precisely onto the thing to build the feet. Um, an integrated hot end would have no tube. That just sits there. The disadvantage of that is more weight for your thing to be carrying around, which means you can't run your thing as fast. And the extra uh, weight on there can cause artifacts in your print. Um, so anyway, <coughs> uh, just something to look out when you're looking at designs. Like what, what, are these, what are these things even look like? Um, but anyway, Boulder Tech um, 279 for that kit. That includes everything. I don't really like polycarbonate. I don't like the LED power supplies. I would rather see you use like an ATX power supply, my computer power supply. More efficient, better power, cheaper, probably get one free sitting around somewhere, you know. Um, I have preferred vendors for most of this stuff, and you can hit a price point better than this. Um, and again, I prefer the Mendel style because it gets you used to putting it together out of, so a, a rep wrap, like I mentioned before, off the shelf stuff. Threaded rod, eight millimeter threaded rod. You can get it from Zorro Industrial Supply, 20, 20 bucks for 24 feet and 12 foot lengths, which is enough for two printers. Um, five millimeter threaded rod and stainless, or eight mil, depending on how you want your verticals to be. Um, and then there's special stuff, stuff you get from 3D printer vendors. But the stuff you can get off the shelf, if you get it off the shelf, you're gonna save yourself money. You know, the 3D printer guy wants to charge you a frickin' 10 bucks for a yard of the threaded rod, but if you can get it from Zorro Tool, 20 bucks for two printers worth, why wouldn't you? They sell on eBay. Check them out, Zorro Tools. Um, although I do recommend if you're buying the threaded rod, you want to make sure you get zinc for your structural, and then for anything that has travel on it, you want stainless, just FYI. Um, this is what a, uh, uh, what would you call this, a vitamin kit? This is a rep strap, really. I mean, this is all of the 3D printed parts for a 3D printer. Eh, minus one or two. I noticed that the gears for the extruder aren't there. Um, but uh, that's what holds your back motor. This is what puts these are. There's actually doubled up. There's two sets of those. Those are your vertices. Um, this is my X carriage here. And then these are just like little pieces that hold it together. And then that holds part of the bed on and the end stops. It's not much, you know. Crank that out in a few days. So one of the things we build with our things is drones. The uh, cool thing about having 3D printing a drone is you crash it and you print it again. <laughs> that guy's that big. Just to give you an idea of the resolution. That's with the camera. <laughs> and that's 3D printed all except for the motors. You can't really see the prop guards. They're little anchor shaped dealies. Um, you can kind of see them in the shadow there. But those are you know, really thin. And you know, they snap right on. Works that great. Yeah, the last time you heard, like this size, right? Uh, the drum? I think so, yeah. Maybe. I don't know which one. I might have had, was it one? I don't know. Um, but yeah, well, this is what we're flying nowadays. How well um, does it fly? Great. 42 grams. Not bad. That's actually with the flight controller that we built as well. It's a alien flight F3. It's actually running clean flight like most people's aren't. So anyway, um, this would be the slide to get if you have any attention to actually building them. These are the guys. Bolt Depot. Great. Great people for fasteners. Zorro Industrial Supply for your uh, rods and such. Uh, Tony34306 is over in Placentia. He's got a container full of uh, mine to be literally a container, shipping container, of uh, industrial pole NEMA 17 motors from Japan. Uh, you can get NEMA 17 motors on eBay. In fact, if you search NEMA 17, you'll find his motors. You will not find better motors for the price, period. If you buy more than one set, you can call them up or make contact and get them for 40 bucks. Um, 40 bucks for five. Honestly, I mean, they're industrial pole. Mine B motors, they're the high torque motors. You just it's, it's stupid the price he's letting them go for. Uh, Boulder Tech, Sidewinder Inc. They're cool. Um, they have kits, they have the full kit, which is the big, you know, 279 bucks. 
Um, and then they do the thing where you can just get the heated bed and the thermistors. They even have a hot end for 20 bucks. Um, but that's going to be one of those things where, you know, that's where the extras are going to cost you money. You know, like 200 bucks, that's with a $20 hot end. I would recommend an $80 hot end because that's one of those pieces that's really going to make the difference between your really solid prints, like the motors. You get cheap motors, uh, who cares? You, you have a problem, they're going to tell you to get another one. Mighty be one, you're not going to have a perfect problem. You're going to be more tracing down problems than your stepper driver, which is why you want to get real Palulu stepper drivers, not, not just whatever. Um, but really the rest is, you know, Arduino, Arduino Mega, the ramps board, which is just an interface for the Palulu Shield. Um, you, LCD is optional, and that all comes with this guy's kit for 50 bucks. It's the ramps board, the Mega, the heated bed, you know, a lot of the stuff you need, and he has a lot of the extra stuff. But that's why I recommend you look at a bomb, uh, build the materials that's out there. Because if you plan on doing this, you need to have a reference for what you're going to buy. Because the fasteners, you know, you're going to need, you know, eight mil bolts. You're going to need a, like a whole two bags of them, you know, and that. You, but you go to Home Depot, you forget them. You're going to go to Home Depot and spend ten bucks on the handful of bolts to forget, and then you're going to know, oh, you need more. Trust me on this. You need to, you need to make sure that you check a bomb and make sure you have the stuff that's going to go into your thing, um, if you're going on your own route. Because I've, I've been there. You know, you, first of all, finding metric threaded, threaded nuts anywhere, Lowe's is the only guys that have them. And like, if they have what you want, they want so much for them. Um, so don't just, ugh, you just like, make one order at Bolt Depot, just stock up on everything, you know? Like 12 mil, eight mil, everything. Um, and it lengthwise, because that's the other thing too. You'll get a bunch of uh, M4s, and then you'll find out that the one thing you need it for is either too short or too long, so you're gonna cut it down. You know, just stock up on the shorts and the longs. They're so cheap, they're so good. Bolt Depot, I love those freaking guys. Um, yeah, that's going to save you money right there. And the structural right there. Electronics, you're halfway there. I mean, really, it's just, you can get, you can get the freaking plastic stuff on eBay for like somebody half to 15 bucks. Just print it off of their printer. Fine, done. You know? But you got to have that. You got to be able to check the stuff up. Because you're going to get halfway. You're going to, oh, I have a bucket of electronics that I got from Folger Tech. I got a bucket of fasteners. I got a bucket of this. If you don't have everything, you're going to get halfway into putting your thing together. And it's just not going to go together. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's really it. I mean, uh, there's really not much to it. Um, the things are really dumb and they're really fun. And um, let me see if I, I got some G code here. I'm going to show you some G code. So, any questions? What's the largest platform that uh, RepRap can really get to before it's... So when you talk about RepRap, really, the platform doesn't matter. I mean, RepRap, you know, like, you see some of these projects where they're printing out houses, it's a RepRap. Yeah. You know, honestly, like, if they're not running for, if they're not running Marlon Firmer on that thing, I would be super surprised. Uh, because that's the thing. Your platform is based on how big your thing is. You can get a heated bed that's 12 feet by 12 feet. Just put it in the software a millimeters, it'll go. Um, so, that being said... Production-wise, pretty much your biggest is going to be like either double um, 200 mil, which is like 200 by 400, or there are some out there that are 400 by 400, like Lulzbot. But that's the thing. As soon as you get into big boutique stuff like that, Lulzbot like wants like 1,000, 2,000 for their big Lulzbot 5. It's an amazing machine, and they've done a lot for the whole RepRap movement. I mean, if you want to buy I, I would highly recommend them. I mean, they support their product. They're a great product. Uh, super expensive, but worth every penny. Um, they're going to support you all the way, and you're going to be able. Like the guy I bought my machine off, he couldn't he couldn't deal with the whole tweaking and stuff. So he sold it to me, and he bought a Lowe's bot. And he's so happy with it. He bought a mini. You know, the mini has like a hundred by hundred build platform. Good, 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 good machine. Um, but anyway, G code is just text. Like this is just a bunch of uh, settings for the printer, settings for the printer, settings for the printer, blah blah blah, and then it goes into coordinates, which is literally just like. And the, uh, my slicer actually puts little notes in here, outer perimeter, you know, so. That's it, doing the outer perimeter. G92. What, is that just X, Y, and Z, or what? Yep. That's right, in millimeters. So, and just to give you an idea of the tool chain, so Thingiverse, Thingiverse has objects on there that people have designed, and they put online. You download this thing, and you pop it into your slicer program, which I mentioned there's several. Your slicer knows about your printer, okay? Has intimate details about your printer. How big the bed, how big the bed is, how fast it extrudes, how fast your motors go, blah, blah, blah. Because there's, there's a cooperation between what your printer knows about itself, which would be in your firmware settings, 
and then what your slicer knows about your printer. Because that's something that to understand is, if you had a friend have a 3D printer, unless you both built your 3D printers exactly the same, and you're using the exact same extruder, exact same cold end, exact same hot end, exact same everything, if I slice something and I send you that file, you will not be able to print, unless we have the exact same damn printer. So that's something to keep in mind. But that's why files aren't distributed as G-code. G-code is what you send to the printer. It's literally the raw left, right, X, Y, spin the motor this hot, this fast. Um, now, there is some efforts to make G-code more universal by expressing extrusion in uh, volume instead of literally raw, like spin the motor a quarter turn, literally, because that's what it's doing. It's doing the translation. Like, it knows how fast, how much plastic is going to come out when it does that and tells it how much to turn. So, um, yeah, all that goes into the accuracy. But yeah, it's XY. It's just Cartesian coordinates. It's pretty basic. Is, was it kind of the uh, reading parallel to PDF? One more time. Would the uh, G code be kind of the uh, 3D analog to PDF file? Not G code. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about that. So what makes your final 3D thing? OK, so there's stuff like Maya or other, like Blender. Blender's an open source 3D thing where they do animation and like, Hey, let me make a snowman by making three balls and then you know making them dance around, right? Cool. All right. So how do, what if I want to print that snowman? Blender can do that. Blender can give me the 3D object and then I can take that into my slicer and do that. So Blender would be almost like a PDF, but just like any CAD software or most CAD software, there's a concept that has it's related to 3D printing and I like to bring it up. It's called SCAD, and I and I can't for the life of me I can never remember what the uh, what the uh, what the S is for, but it's Pure data drafting, obviously. Uh, but basically, it's using code to generate physical objects. So like in the case of that snowman, I can tell it I want to, with code, I can say sphere, you know, two inches wide, like inches or millimeter, you know, 40 centimeters wide. Another sphere, x raised by 20 centimeters, or 20 millimeters by 30 millimeters, and then raised again, and 10 millimeters raised by 40 millimeters. And then I can, I can even have those be variables. I can send that file off to you. You can change the variables. You can say, you know, I want the head higher. I want the head bigger. I want to put some eyes on it. And then send me back that file. And just like any kind of code, we can change it. And unlike CAD, where if I made that snowman, trying to pull that middle thing out might leave a void. You know, you, you, that sphere is there. It's part of that physical object. Like in SketchUp, if you've ever played with SketchUp, you, it's additive geometry. And removing something from an additive geometry isn't always clean. But with SCAD, if you have a hook coming out of something, that hook is just defined in the code, and you just redefine where that hook appears or how big that hook is, and recompile the design, and you're in business. Actually, this is, um, oh, I thought I had it open. Let me fire it up. Um, this is the, <coughs> got to render it. This is the uh, quad that uh, I showed you a minute ago. Actually, I was printing somebody else's design, and I didn't like that I didn't have source for it. So I actually went through, and there's a concept in, in, in these files or in 3D printing stuff called parametric. And when something's parametric, I can define parameters that define the properties of my final object. Um, Thingiverse has support for these, and it's directly through OpenSCAD, um, where you know you tell it like if you you know you have you want to print out a wrench holder tell it how wide your wrench is, and it prints out a design with, you, know, you tell it how many wrenches you have, and how wide they are, and it prints you out a rack, or even like actually, <coughs> this guy, this is off of a Thingiverse thing, it's my, it's my call sign, and you just tell it your call sign, and it prints out, it's, it's OpenSCAD, and it just generates this file, and actually the advantage of that is I can do it offline. In the OpenSCAD software, you can see this design's pretty complex, so it takes a bit to generate. This, this, this software is not very well optimized. Um, but uh, it has like a font in there, and it draws this out at a certain height, a certain width, and it spits it out, and then I can take that resulting object file to my 3D printer and kick it out. So that's what that is. Actually, this is, um, this is PLA, just to give you an idea. There, the ABS is a very common plastic that you'll see, but you need a hotter hot end to do it, and it generates toxic fumes. Um, PLA is very common, it's very easy to print, it's forgiving, and it's pretty durable. It's, uh, it's brittle. Um, but I've had this guy in my pocket for, you know, how long have we been printing now? I guess a, since November of last year or whatever, or the year before. Um, and it's, it's been great, no problems. It's got, it, the, you know, the hook isn't too meaty and it's held up fine. Um, and then there's a new one coming out. Um, 
Professional memory, Chris. What's the one we've been printing in? PET. PET. PET is actually engineering plastic. Um, it's really stable. It's really durable. Uh, it doesn't have the brittleness that PLA does. It doesn't want to deform in the sun like uh, PLA and ABS tend to. Uh, it's a very nice plastic, um, but it's not the cheapest. Only a few people have it. Um, so, but yeah, that's one to look into. Actually, Monoprice has one. The finish, Monoprice, the cable control. Uh, the finish isn't great. Um, like, it doesn't get put up the colors, but structurally, it's great. I freaking love it. Um, so this thing should be finishing up any freaking time. Now, there you go. Um, so, eh. Wish I could pop that out or something to make it bigger for you guys. But, um, yeah, essentially this is, uh, this thing has parameters, if you can see that over here. So I tell it how thick, how wide, how many nodes, because I went, I was, I was going crazy with this thing. I actually made it so I could technically make a, a hexacopter with it. I can just tell it to do six nodes, and it's going to do a sine cosine function to find out how to put whatever uh, the node width. So this is how clampy these motor channels are. If I used bigger motors, maybe I'd have to update to 9.5 millimeters or whatever. I need to fit that within these, depending on how many nodes I have. I can do that all in code. So I could fire that. I could put it six and link some freaky ass thing that I'm probably never going to use. Um, and then there's some other functions like how thick my layers are, and then uh, flight channel. Uh, uh, sorry, flight controller width because we, we made these flight controllers that are specifically wide. If I had a bigger flight controller, maybe I'd want to print it wider or narrower, so it would just snap right in there. Um, what you have over there with the slashes looks like, is that C? No, um, th it, it's a C-like syntax, but this is open scale. And so literally things are defined as, um, like it might be, and it's a little bit out of focus. Let me, let me scroll it up and you can see it over there. Uh, so this is rendering the body and the motors and the sides as a function. And if I go to that function, like uh, module FC tray here, it's literally just taking cubes and uh, blah, 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 a bunch of math. I mean, like, you know, cylinder height of thickness that I define times 2.5, which is like a little bit of a magic number, but that's how I'm defining this cup. Um, just it's two and a half times the height. Um, node width plus thickness, and then it's doing a radius of it with 100 facets. Um, it, it, you know, you get into the basics of the stuff, and you can do a lot with a little. Like I had only been screwing with this stuff for like three months, and like I finally just, you know, it, it's geometry. Can you, if you can draw it on paper and figure out how far something is away to something, you know, like say you want to make a clamp for this table, you measure the thickness with a micrometer, you enter that in as a dimension, and you just slap the rest of the shapes around that. You know, so anyway, SCAD's really cool. It's actually, aside from the whole 3D printing thing, whether you buy or build or do whatever with 3D printer, learn SCAD. Because you get some, you're going to find a design on like Thingiverse, and then you're going to want to modify it, and then you're not going to be able to. You're going to wish that frickin' file was SCAD. That's actually kind of a hobby of mine, is finding stuff that isn't in SCAD and making it into a SCAD file. Hit me. Uh, okay, so can you talk, because you talked about that before, can you talk about this, uh, Printer version versus versus the pre-made ones. Yeah. Like, like what you're showing, in terms of like uh, durability and that type of thing. And the other thing is, can you bring the 3D printer in one time? Yeah, I can. We'll need to coordinate that. It's kind of a pain in the ass to transport. And uh, okay. You know, we're really busy right now. So I'm sure, and until I can get into a new apartment, um, that's going to be. Uh, We'll see. Once I can get into a bigger place, there, I have some room to spread around. My entire shop is now sitting in a 200. I had a, I had a 2,000 square foot warehouse that is now crammed into a 200 square foot uh, storage storage area. So uh, yeah, I lost some of my goodies. Um, luckily, the 3D printer is still still set up over at uh, my bro's pad, but uh, I'm trying to get him over with me in the area so we can have more you know room to spread out. Would, um, you, would you be our, out of our yeah. money? Would you be up for coming to a few of our meetings and helping mentor us on getting one of these yes. DIYs rolling here? Yeah, we've been, absolutely. We've I been mean, wanting to do one with the group. You know, yeah, I mean, really, the question is, I mean, if you want to build it, you know, really, it's about getting all the parts together, right. um, and right. that's really the, the first the first goal. You know, once you get the um, that's right. once you get the once you get the parts together, it's really just about assembling it. And if we can get that far, then yeah, you're, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll be in here to help you guys. So you say basically you can get all the parts for 200 bucks. 
around there. I mean, I'm telling you, you're going to have to source it yourself and do some searching. I'm giving you the vendors, but uh, yeah. So is there, if we can get some, so that's that's the part where I'm thinking your advice would be the most helpful is in developing the list. I mean, we can do the legwork. I'm willing to do most of it myself, even um, to go and find the stuff. And we just kind of need to kind of know how how to develop a bomb and how to you know you know like where where the good sourcing. You know, you know, what what materials? I mean, you should be able to get one. What exactly to get mainly? Yeah, we need to know exactly what to get. Bomb means build up materials. Yeah, build up materials. Um, and you really can, the first thing to start off with is what you want to build. You know, um, if you decide that you want like a Mendel three, you know, you need to go look at the Mendel three uh, building materials and then go off of that. Um, okay, and, and satisfy it. To that's, a that's what I was going to ask. Is where do you start? So you go online and you basically look up a Mendel three. Yeah, I mean Mendel, and, uh, Mendel three is very well documented because it's sold as a kit. And actually, it, Mendel, um, sorry, RepRap Pro is the company that makes the Mendel three. Mendel is the name of the open source design, just like Linux. Okay, okay. Mendel three would be like your Ubuntu Linux. Okay. Um, so the Mendel 3 is Adrian Bower is the one who originated the concept of the rep wrap. Um, so he's you know trustworthy dude, whatever. Um, so you go to Mendel, you go to uh, reprapro.org, I think it is, or, C, or co.uk. Uh, they have all the instructions. You can buy their kit. It's like 400 pounds though, imported. Like geez, um, you know you build this thing and you're literally getting a box of stuff and you're building it. You know, following the instructions. It's an open source project once again. Um, so you can build it yourself, or you can buy the, you know, buy it as a kit, um, or you can just follow the build of materials and build it yourself. In fact, um, I think I've got the Git, because it's on GitHub. You can just clone the Git, and the build of materials all there. Um, and then there's there's exotic stuff like the Mendel 90. Uh, Mendel 90 is really cool um, because it's. Uh, it's it's fully parametric, and I, I say that to an extreme degree. Um, let me see if I've got this thing because it's ridiculous. Uh, hardware Mendel. I even started working on my own rev a bit. Um, notice there's Python files here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that with the crappy focus on this thing. Let me see. That thing's so touchy. I swear. Oh, I had it. There we go. Um, so there's literally Python files here which are used to generate the SCAD files that create, like it, it literally is a program that generates a 3D printer based on the settings that you provide. Like, no joke. You tell it the thickness of material you want to use, and it will create, like, and what they, what they want you to do with this is, um, like you can cut it out, you can just get some plywood and make the measurements and get a freaking saber saw and, brrr, and do it out. I didn't want to do that just because that was like, you know, what. It's not like, what if you don't have a saber saw, but I just, I felt better about putting it together from threaded rod that I could cut than doing the saber saw thing. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to go that direction, you could definitely go that direction. And it's pretty freaking cool. It's so impressive what he's done. Uh, you literally run the Python file against your definition file, telling it what you want to make it out of. It cranks out an assembly manual for you with camera angles generated from OpenSCAD, <laughs> parametrically reflecting the settings that you created. It's, it's... It's ridiculous. What's like this called? Mendel yeah, 90. Mendel 90. Mendel 90. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not even a program. It's it's a printer design that's distributed as a fully parametric program, okay. including the Python files. Like you have you have to have like if you're on a Mac, if you're on Linux, you're fine. Hey, love. Um, but you have to point your OpenSCAD executable to the program to get it to generate the PDFs or whatever if you're doing it that deep. Um, but it's it's just super ridiculous what he's done. Uh, but their sign making material, uh, it's like. Uh, it's a polycarbonate with aluminum sandwiched, and it's it's perfect for this. Unfortunately, it's expensive, and like really to do this right, like you know, if I'm getting like this parametric nice, like template, my I'd love to throw that at a guy with a water jet and have him crank that out of aluminum or something. But you know what? I got the price of 800 bucks to just get those sheets done in aluminum from a guy with a water jet. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. Sign guy wants 80 bucks an hour and 200 dollars to set up the tooling. No. You know, if there was somebody who was cranking these things out and just had them, and frankly, I think the Mendel 90 guy actually does have sets of his stuff available, both as like sheets of material and with or without parts. And here again, what you bolt onto that thing, NEMA 17 motors, your hot end of choice, eight millimeter smooth rods, done. You know, 
So that goes into the vitamins. Like the design that I prefer has as many vitamins as possible that I know I can get on the open market from anywhere. Home Depot has them. Lowe's has them. Online dudes have them. Uh, that design requires a few more things that you're going to have to source yourself, either through them, uh, going to a sign guy, knowing somebody who has a water jet, or cranking it out out of wood and a uh, saber saw. You know? So there, it's cool that there's designs out there, which is why learning more about the back of it, Marlin firmware, how that, that's literally just plugging into your Cartesian stuff, which is just the motors. Those are going to be plugged into your ramps board. I mean, all of those pieces can be interchanged. You're, you're, you don't have to use a Rambo board, you can use a smoothie board. Uh, why? I don't know. Rambo? You can use a Rambo board. Why? I don't know. Ramp board's been out there and it's super cheap. That's why I kind of recommend it for starters and because it gives you the an easy route to replicate. You know, if a guy wants one, cool man. This is how much it's going to cost for the parts and I'll hope you do it. Right? But uh, yeah, it's a cool hobby. Anyway. Any other questions? Is there a place that you can recommend to go to print 3D files? Is there oh, um, don't do Shapeways unless you got a lot of money. Um, uh, shoot, Chris, do you remember? Uh, three, what's the, what's the, there's, you, if you have a 3D printer, you can join like this. 3D Hubs, I think it's 3D Hubs. Um, 3D Hubs has, uh, let me turn off the Wi Fi, it's killing my battery. Um, 3D Hubs has people with 3D printers. And you can send them a design, and they will uh, print it for you for a very reasonable price. What's up? Can you send me, what, can you send me the video? Um, sure. I'll put, put it up on YouTube. Just, uh, can you just put a link on the on the Weedup site? Uh, sure. Okay, Somebody, thank you. Uh, Nate, you can send me a link to the Weedup. Yay! Are there any open source printers that print non-plasticky things? Such as? Well, rep wrap. I mean, if like, you want to print with uh, food or solder laser, paste or... or Ceramic, okay, well, one of the first 3D printers actually printed with sugar. Um, and yeah, so what it comes down to there is just your extruder. And, um, you know, non extruder versions? Like, just give me an example of what you might want to print with that. Maybe I can help you out. A wrench. Print a wrench. Okay, so the only the, the way that's been done is you have to cast it. Um, you can print a wrench made out of plastic, but if you want to do that then in metal, you're going to have to cast it using a, 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 a like basically you can, you can print in wax and then do a lost wax casting, um, but, and, you, and you can print in metal, but honestly with the, um, you know, the interlayer frailty, like that's not going to be a functional tool. You know, it's kind of a proof of concept. In fact, um, the, 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 the test models that they used for the 3D printer that they sent up to the spaceship are really nice, and one of them is a wrench. What did they print them out of? Uh, in the spaceship? I think it's PLA. Because it's polylactic acid, you know, it's easy to come by, it prints pretty low temp, it's non toxic. I understand some of the parts and the motors on, uh, on uh, the SpaceX Dragon are 3D printed. That would be a different type of process. That's metal sintering. So, what, the way that works is that's more like what Shapeways does. Totally different process. This is actually called, there's different types of 3D, 3D, uh, 3D printing processes. Uh, FFF is fused filament formation, uh, I want to say. There's, uh, I can't remember the last F, uh, but fused filament. And then uh, stintering, um, selective SLS, or you can also have uh, uh, lithography. Uh, those are the two different types they can do. Like They, they actually use this for what, printing. What does this mean in plain English? Say again? What does it mean in plain English? I was going to explain. So the selective laser sintering, basically you end up with like, uh, imagine you have an empty void, and you sprinkle this powder in it. Then you use a laser to sinter the powder into a solid piece. You sprinkle more powder on, you sinter it again. Sprinkle, 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 blast, blast, So it's blast. like kind of like, like laser welding. Correct. It's blue with the material. Correct. Now, the advantage of that is that a 3D printer has some distinct disadvantages. Uh, printing out a tree, or like for instance, say you have a uh, golf ball on a tee that you want to print. It's going to be difficult to print without support because, you know, it's got this overhang area which it's going to try and print out in the air and it's going to droop. Um, selective laser sintering doesn't have any of those disadvantages because the entire thing is printed solid. As long as there's somewhere for the excess material to come out, as soon as it's done, you've got this pile of powder, you shake it off and you've got your stintered, welded object there in the middle. So, so, so you layer of powder and just zip the stuff that you want solid, then you put another little layer of powder then you zip that. So Plastic. you could, in fact, create a complete sphere, but then With you wouldn't be able to inside. get the power out of it. Yep. Uh, you, yeah, you can do a complete sphere. Uh, you can do a cage. They, yeah, they, you can do weird stuff like a box within a cage within a ball in that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. 
as long as you have the ability to get the powder out, yeah, it's there. But and um, there's this thing. It would be very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. And uh, Shapeway is that you can get like a 3D printed ring um, in gold even uh, from Shapeways uh, for, you know, not too expensive. Because you do it by material. You could do it in their basic white um, for probably like 50 bucks, which is a lot. Because uh, that's like five cents of material in this thing, which is why it's a joke. Um, but it would be super high quality. And once you make sure it fit and everything, well, you can get to send it out and do it in gold for like 300 bucks. And like, well, that's pretty freaking cool. It's a totally custom ring of your own custom design. In fact, this chick, uh, Bathsheba, that I saw at the Maker Fair, sells procedurally generated math paperweight things uh, that are uh, made in OpenSCAD and printed out with Shapeways metal. It's like bronze, they do bronze, they, they do all kinds of metals now, it's ridiculous. Very impressive stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that's SLS, that's how they're making the rocket motors and stuff. Different technology, but similar. Two questions. Yeah. Your full fan and your YouTube, YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube channel, uh, it should be under uh, L20, E L T O O Z E R O, and call sign is K I 6 Y D P, uh, Kilo Indigo 6, Yankee Delta Papa. Thank you. What was your YouTube channel? L20, E L T O O Z E R O. Or you can do it through my email address, which is Lee at brains.net here. Also. Yeah, that's kind of fast. Hang on, I'll just, I'll just put it up on the screen here for you. But you have all information on QRZ. Um, yeah, there should be some stuff on there. Um, let me do this. Uh, Shati, 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 there we go. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh very good. Right. Make sure you get the two ladies in there. Feel free to email me your questions. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. And I wish you luck on your quest of uh, looking into 3D printing. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a blast. Thank you. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.